With the backdrop that uh, Gregory is providing on the macro side of things, um, I don't think you find it surprising that it's been a challenging period for a lot of the listed uh, names on the exchange. So if I start with the banks, this is the performance uh, year to date. So you can see that pretty much everything is down except for, for ETI. So, um, but what's visible on this slide also is you find that the, the bigger banks um, tend to uh, have performed um, better than the tier two banks. And it's a theme that you'd see uh, consistently through uh, the presentation. Uh, there's a bank sector report that goes into a lot more detail, which you should have in your packs, uh, but it's a, it's a theme that you see run through this presentation. If we look at the projection of the return on equity for these banks, um, since 2012, we've been on a steady decline uh, for several reasons. Even though loans have been growing, there have been other headwinds that the banks have been facing. Um, so COT, Amcon, CRL, all these things um, have been niggling away at uh, the earnings of, of the banks. But if I look at the uh, first half results of the banks uh, on the pre-tax profit basis, yes, things are supposed to be really difficult this year, but um, on average for our sector, the year-on-year -year growth for pre-tax profit is uh, more than 10%, which, yes, it's not 20%, 15%, uh, but we'll take this any day. Um, also, relative to our expectations, they didn't really um, outperform or uh, underperform. They, they're broadly in line. But what you see again is the bigger banks, so the Accesses, the GTs, the UBAs, and the Zeniths have done way better than the tier two banks. Yeah? Then um, on loan growth, so you're looking at the drivers, um, if, if you go back to 14, 13, 12, you'd find that the banks were growing consistently um, between 15 and 20% on average. Now, as of H1, you were looking at uh, anywhere between 5 and 10% on average. If you analyze that, the numbers still look okay, but um, you've got to remember that there's some you know, deflationary inf uh, impact in there. So there's some FX num um, effects that make the numbers look slightly better than you'd expect. Having said that, you see the Zenith and UBAs growing a lot stronger than um, uh, they top the table again. Non-interest income has also been challenged. As I said, um, removal of CO2 revenues or reduction in CO2 revenues, uh, which is basically a charge on transactions um, for banks. Um, but that's also growing. So um, despite all the problems that the banks seem to be um, experiencing, they, they're doing the, you know, a relatively decent job. If you look at the two revenue lines, uh, so net interest income or funding income um, and non-interest income, you'd find again that um, the numbers don't look too bad as of H1. And you'd find again that the larger banks are growing faster, therefore the implication is they're, they're, they're gaining market share uh, from the smaller banks. Now, the scale advantages of the bigger banks, I think, is part of what's uh, coming to the fore here. So we've always known that, I mean, GT Bank's cost income ratio is uh, I say sometimes it's, it's un-Nigerian because it's, uh, it's 40%. Uh, you have to look um, to over 50% before you find the next bank, which is Zenith. And then after Zenith, you have to jump another um, 10 percentage points to get to the next bank, which is Access. And then the next one is UBA. So again, the biggest banks, um, are, not only are they growing faster, um, their cost income ratios are better. So the scale advantages are just really working for these guys. Um, when you see uh, a tier two bank uh, reporting improvements year on year, there is an explanation that's not sustainable, uh, at least for that time period, uh, behind it. So for example, um, I know there may be some people in the audience, but if I were to pick, say, um, say Fidelity, for example, you'd see that the, there's an improvement. The minuses represent improvements. So the minuses uh, are similar to what you find for, um, for the bigger banks, uh, over 300 basis points year on year. But actually, if you look on the chart, you see that the absolute cost income ratio uh, is very high. So there's a lot of work to do uh, for them. And also, last year, um, there were some base effects that make the H1 number this year look uh, better for Fidelity. So again, um, the bigger banks uh, are where to be. If we move on to asset quality, which I think is the biggest topic I think going on in the sector at the moment, um, even my colleagues at work sometimes come to me and say, do you believe those numbers that they reported? Well, you know, there's some... At the start of the year, we had pretty high numbers for asset quality. Um, 
the, the risk is to believe that everybody in the sector is experiencing exactly the same issues, um, and therefore, if some bank reports um, difficult numbers because of asset quality issues, then by and large, everybody else uh, will report the same thing. That, that is not the truth. If you go back to 2008, 2009, the worst ratio that is in the bank, which is known very well for asset quality, um, reported was 6 point, I think 6.5% at the worst of the crisis. So it's not true slash not fair to assume that everybody will be hit uh, with the same challenges um, as Bank A, right? The first thing to say is that I accept that the guidance that the banks have given to me look too good to be true um, across the board. So if a GT bank or Zenith bank that people gen gen tend to respect for asset quality guides to less than 5% NPL ratio, it's kind of difficult to believe that every bank that guides to less than 5% NPL ratio um, can be taken um, in the same light as GT or Zenith, just because the historical trends do not support that. Now, the CBN have a view that they don't want banks to be reporting NPL ratios over 5%, so you could argue that maybe that's why banks are trying not to get a call from the CBN to explain to them why the NPL ratio is over 5%. So what we've tended to do is to assume that if you've not shown this trend historically, then we're not going to give you the benefit of the doubt. So if you look on the um, table on the left, you find that the guidance generally is below 5%, but we expect that these ratios will get worse. However, we don't expect anywhere close to 10% for the sector average uh, by the end of this year. I put the table on the right to point out that um, there is a big difference between a tier one bank and a tier two bank in terms of asset quality and the way banks have decided to run their uh, operations. So if you look at Zenith, which I've talked about a bit, in terms of asset quality, Zenith is one of the best in this country. Concentration risk is really what I'm trying to show on the uh, table on the right. So um, for both banks, you see a worsening in six months in terms of the top five sectors, what those account for in their loan books. So for Zenith, it was about 50% in December. It's gone up to almost 60% as of June. For Diamond, the top five sectors represented 73% in December, and as of June was 78%. So just based on the numbers, no one is saying that you know, these books are going to go bad, but just based on concentration risk alone, again, the likes of the Zeniths are set up better than uh, a Diamond Bank. Um, where this takes us is that generally, if you look at banks in Nigeria, they tend to report ROEs of below 15% or above 20%. The 15 to 20% range is extremely unstable. So that's where you tend to find mispricing. So if you listen to several tier two banks, they'll tell you that, oh, we'll get a 20%. We've been hearing this for the last God knows how many years, seven years. Uh, it's been extremely difficult to do over 15% for these banks. So whenever you hear a tier two bank tell you they're going to do 15 or 20%, just discount it or ask them a lot of questions because the, 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 the evidence doesn't support that. Now, if you find a bank that you should expect to be above 20% in the 15 to 20% range, there's likely to be a sort of mispricing. Either the market is waiting for that bank to recover uh, or it is punishing the bank because of some historical reasons. Um, sometimes you find the likes of a UBA in that category. Um, so this gulf, we think, will open up even more going forward uh, based on all the lines on the P&L that I've just gone through in the previous slides. So we expect the divergence between the larger and the smaller banks. Now, what you find with, in terms of valuation is that the tier two banks are trading well below book. We don't believe this is justified. However, until there is evidence that the tier two banks can show some improvement that's borderline sustainable, I think the market will just continue to say, you know what, I couldn't care less. When you have something interesting to report to the market, we will pay attention. For now, we'll just stick to the guys that we know that the results may be boring, uh, aka GT this week. The numbers weren't amazing, but actually you know roughly that they were going to do 120 billion this year. They said that as out of this year. So they're on track to, to, to achieve that. The, the tier two banks have to consistently deliver results that people can believe. So you may report very good numbers in Q1, but by Q4, let's see whether your provisions line don't blow up. To move on to the non-financials, I'm focusing uh, purely on consumer goods here because I think it's topical and you see, you hear more uh, from some of the panel discussions later today. The price, of, uh, price to earning multiples for uh, this space has generally moved down over the last few years. That's not to say that the 23.6 times P multiple you find there is actually justifiable. It's still way too high. We can argue that those numbers should be lower. 
because of what's happened to the earnings. If you look at the um, H1 pre-tax profits, generally you see um, a worrying weakness, and this has been um, consistent for some years. We had Nestle's results last night. Uh, it was a breath of fresh air. For the first time, there were some relatively decent results. DSR also reported relatively okay numbers, but by and large, across the space, it's been very, very challenging. You'd expect that with the decline in raw material prices, given that we import quite a lot of stuff, uh, including raw materials, um, that this will actually uh, positively impact earnings in this country for these uh, companies. But what you find is that there are other issues that they have to deal with. For example, FX devaluation, insecurity in the north, messed up the distribution uh, network. And then competition is really beginning to cause problems for some of the non-food companies particularly, right? Because, you know, whether you're Nigerian or not Nigerian, you care more about what you put inside your body, uh, but if you're really pressed for, um, if, you're, if your uh, household wallet, wallet is really squeezed, then you may experiment with other things, right? So if you're in the food category, you may get away with it. If you're in the non-food category, you really have to work out to sustain your market share. So that's pretty much it on the macro and equity side of things. Um, myself and Gregory are happy to take questions if there are any. Um, if not, we'll happily go back and join the rest of you. Thank you.